May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our salvation. And all God's people said, Amen. You know, Paul had a lot on his plate and on his mind when he wrote to that church at Corinth. First of all, the city itself was a diverse collection of wickedness, greed, and immorality. In fact, in the Latin, there was a verb that, when translated, meant to Corinthianize, which meant to have intercourse with prostitutes. Let's think Las Vegas with togas. And because its citizenry was such an eclectic hodgepodge of peoples from various cultures and religions, there were many different temples to choose from. In place of the philosophy and the debates that were found in Athens, Corinth boasted artisans whose products were world-renowned and highly sought after. It was a commercial center. And what they lacked in culture and refinement, they made up for in wealth and debauchery. Now, Paul had experienced Corinth personally. He knew it was tough to be a Christian in such a sin-laden place. And where Paul would normally begin his letter with some doctrinal instruction, followed by any necessary admonition for the readers, here he greets the Corinthians, giving thanks to God for them, and then he lowers the boom. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Infighting and divisions had taken up residence, and the congregation found itself at odds both with the external temptations of the city as well as its own internal discord. Later, Paul will be addressing many other issues and problems that he observes in their community. As I said earlier, with the Corinthian congregation, Paul had a lot on his plate and a lot on his mind. Now, with everything that was wrong in that congregation, where to start? From divisions in the church to sexual immorality among its members to lawsuits between believers to idolatry to doubts about the resurrection, where does one begin? As the old adage goes, how do you eat the elephant in the room? One bite at a time. Inspired by God and guided by the Holy Spirit, Paul directly addresses the Corinthians and he says to them, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us that are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And then he goes on to say, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, at first glance, Paul's words, while poetic and powerful, seem to the uninitiated to miss the point. I mean, if there's such disunity and division in the congregation, shouldn't that be what he focuses on? How does Christ crucified speak to that? If there's such rampant sexual immorality pervasive among the members then how does Christ crucified correct such immoral behavior? Just how is preaching the crucifixion of Jesus upon the cross of Calvary affect the matter of brothers suing brothers? Or food sacrificed to idols because the Moose Lodge has the best steaks in town? How is the idolatry challenged by the crucifixion, or spiritual gifts among the believers, or the matters of orderly worship and generosity in giving to other people. With so many matters to be dealt with among the membership of Corinth, or really any church as that goes, how does the preaching of Christ crucified apply to the situation? And yet, seven verses later, Paul doubles down for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Now when you and I look at the cross, especially a crucifix like this one here, where, where Christ is shown in all of his misery and agony, we see the grace of God. While the glory and the majesty of God can be ascertained in the created heavens and the earth, God's grace in terms of its full effects is seen on the cross with the crucifixion of Jesus the Christ. The message of the crucified Christ is foundational for all the rest of our faith and our doctrines and our theology. In fact, as Lutherans, our particular brand of theology is called the theology of the cross. For at Calvary, we see God at work through his son's sacrifice for humankind. We see the length and the depth and the breadth of God's redemptive love hanging there, crying out, Father, forgive them. Knowing God's great love for me causes me to reflect on why I want to be a part of his kingdom of grace. And after all, who wouldn't want to be? Now to understand the misery and damage of our lawlessness among one another, one first needs to understand God's law and what it expressly demands of us. A quick scan of the Ten Commandments reflects the failure on our parts to walk faithfully with our God or to act lovingly toward our neighbor. As Jesus summarizes the commandments to a simple formula of love God, love others, repeat, we struggle even in these basics. The purpose of Christ's sacrificial death was to fulfill our obligations to keep God's law, just as Paul had told the Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law, so that we might redeem, receive adoption as sons. Preaching Christ crucified reminds us that Jesus suffered and died to pay the penalty for our sins. Just as the Bible tells us, since therefore the children of share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that though death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. If left to our own efforts, we would never achieve the righteousness God's law requires of us. And so in his love and grace, God intervenes for us and for our salvation in Jesus Christ. As the Bible tells us, Christ Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The message of Christ crucified lays the foundation for our hope and comfort unlike any other message ever could or would. After all, he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Paul declares we preach Christ crucified because it lays the foundation for our faith. We are rescued, redeemed, and restored unto God only through the cross of Jesus. That sure and certain hope informs us and encourages us in how to live and move and have our being this side of heaven. Christ's sacrifice, then how can we disagree or cause divisions because we're seeking to have things go our way? If the crucified Christ attitude is, for even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, how dare we stomp our feet and put our hands on our hips and then demand our way? If we understand the true and deep love of God in sending his son for us, the great love of Jesus that moved him to suffer and die for us, then how can we dishonor God by living in perversity and immorality, casting off the mantle of God's love for the embrace of a whore? If God's own son died to make us righteous in the demands of his law, how can we take one another to court rather than work out things between the two of us. How can we trade God's grace for a life lived outside of his kingdom, of worshiping gods of our own creating, rather than the God who created all things? How can we hear the gospel and then walk away, knowing that you were transformed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, 
but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. As you can see, my friends, to preach Christ crucified is to lay a foundation for a church community built on selfless, sacrificial love and the knowledge of God's desire to love and give, to redeem and restore, to empower and to encourage us to love God, love others, repeat. You get this down, Pat, and you're equipped to deal with the rest. Think in any other terms, and the Corinthians are just a snapshot of what a church headed to hell in a handbasket looks like. We have hope for our church because of the hope of our church, which is founded on the preaching of Christ crucified. By the cross, we know just how far God was and is willing to go to achieve his desired outcome for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And so it is that I preach the word of the cross, though it is folly to those who are perishing, because to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So may God ever direct and bless the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, so that we always confess Christ as the power of God and the wisdom of God, all for the sake of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. And now as a people who have been blessed by God, we return our gifts and our tithes and offerings through our offering.